Hello, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur here on behalf of the Dinosaur Broadcasting Corporation. Tonight we have a special presentation for you on the evolution of flight and the utility of intermediate stages on the path to true flight. Our presenter for this program is world famous Dino Attenborough. Now here is our feature presentation. Hello, my name is Dino Attenborough and I'm here to take you on a marvelous journey through time and space to examine that most wonderful mode of travel among living things, flight. Flight has, as far as we can tell, only evolved four times in the history of life on Earth. Once in insects, once in pterosaurs, once in birds, and once in bats. It is these last two for which we have the most information, and so it is on them that we shall focus. According to many evolution deniers, the steps from terrestrial locomotion to flight are infeasible, because a half-formed wing would be of little to no use to a creature, and each step toward flight would be detrimental to an organism. If this were true, then natural selection would prohibit the evolution of flight, and the existence of animals with the ability of flight would require some kind of design, whether by some deity or some other, perhaps alien intelligence. Let's look at some examples of this argument from the critics themselves. If a reptile became a bird, the legs became a wing. The front legs became wings. Significant differences. How are mutations going to turn a leg into a wing? Has anybody ever seen a living animal with half a leg, half a wing? The answer is no. That's lack of empirical evidence. In case you don't know, there are a few differences between a dinosaur and a bird. You don't just put a few feathers on them and say, come on, man, give it a try. It won't hurt too bad. You see, birds have feathers, they have two legs and two wings. Reptiles have four perfectly good legs. If he's going to evolve to a bird, somewhere along the line, his front legs are going to be half wing and half leg, which means now he can't fly and he can't walk. He's got a problem. Who's going to feed him during this transitional stage? Hmm? All right, but are the stages from non-flying to flying animals detrimental? What good is half a wing? Well, as it turns out, there are some very good uses for half a wing. Primarily, gliding. The difference between a glide and a flight is that all of the energy used in a glide must be gained either from the potential energy the glider gains from starting high up, or it can be supplemented by air currents, but the glider itself is not adding to the total energy of the glide. Flight, on the other hand, is powered, and the flyer can stay aloft as long as it puts as much or more energy into the flight as it is losing to drag and gravity. Between the two, we have something that might be called a powered glide. In this circumstance, the glider can add energy to extend the flight, but cannot do it at a pace equal to or greater than the losses it experiences. Essentially, this lets a creature glide much longer, but still, it cannot do things such as gain altitude beyond its starting point or fly level. Let's look at some gliding animals who have what might be called half a wing. This marvelous little creature is Rhacophorus nigropalmatus, or Wallace's flying frog. Of course, it can't actually fly, but rather, it can glide. The animal uses webbing between its toes to increase the lift it experiences in a fall, allowing it to direct and extend what would otherwise be a ballistic plummet into a graceful and controlled glide which allows it to both escape immediate danger from things like tree snakes, which would like to eat it, as well as land in a safe place among the branches from where it can continue to hunt and live. Really, any animal has some degree of control over how and where it lands after a jump or fall, and all it takes to increase this is any feature that increases lift. In this case, it is the webbing between the fingers. A common solution seen in frogs, pterosaurs, bats, and even some non-avian dinosaurs. Next we come to a more advanced glider, with what might be called two-thirds of a wing. This strange creature looks like a cross between a shrew, a monkey, and a bat. In fact, it is none of those things, although calling it a monkey is closest to the truth. This is a Kalugo, and it is the only non-primate you are content left. Its closest relatives are the true primates, followed by the gliers, that is, lagomorphs and rodents. Like Wallace's flying frog, the Kalugo has skin between its fingers, but it also has enormous wing-like flaps of skin from wrist to ankle, making it an exceptionally able glider, sometimes going some 70 horizontal meters in a single jump, 
barely losing any altitude at all. This is just a hair's breadth away from flight. All that the Kalugo needs is just even the slightest additional ability to add thrust to its glides, and it could equal or even exceed the energy loss rate and achieve true flight. Now, let's look at some true flyers. Bats. Bats are members of the order Chiroptera. While you might not know it from looking around, bats are second only to rodents in terms of their success. They comprise around 1,200 described species, about a fifth of all known mammal species. Bats eat such things as insects, fish, amphibians, fruit, nectar, and pollen. They range in size from the tiny hog-nosed bat, perhaps the smallest living mammal, to the flying fox, which can reach nearly two meters in wingspan. One of the first things you might notice about a bat is that its wing is just an exaggerated version of the Kalugos. This similarity is so strong that it was once thought that the two must be closely related, and that bats may even have been primates. We now know this not to be the case, but from a morphological standpoint, Kalugos show us how bats went from climbing forelimbs, to half a wing, to full-fledged winged flight. Like a Kalugo, the bat fingers have extensive webbing between them, and a bat has such a membrane stretching all the way to the ankle, but now it stretches not just from the wrist, but all the way from the pinky finger. So, we've seen one form of flight that is using skin and fingers to form flight surfaces, which can also incorporate skin stretching to the ankle from the arm. But this is not how birds fly. Unfortunately, there are not many living examples of half-wing forms leading to bird flight. But, fortunately for scientists, the fossil fields of China have, over the last decade or so, yielded some amazing fossils, and together with these and other fossils, we can piece together the path of birds all the way from primitive archosauromorphs, through the bipedal theropods, to tree-dwelling gliders, to powered avian flyers. Our story starts with an animal called Eupocaria. At first glance, you might be forgiven for thinking it were a lizard, but closer examination reveals its true nature. It tends to carry its legs directly under the body, and its skull is specialized for bearing stress while being very lightweight. Further, it is very hind-leg dominant, so much so that it may have been able to run on just two legs. While Eupocaria is probably not a direct ancestor of the dinosaurs, it is structurally similar to that animal. It is a transition between the more advanced archosaurs of the later Triassic and the more primitive sauropsids of the end Permian and early Triassic. The forelimbs of this animal are typical of the legs that will eventually evolve into a bird wing, although at this stage they are very far from such a form. Next, we have an archosaur that is almost, but not quite, a dinosaur. This is Lagerpeton, and now we can see that in this line of archosaurs, the hind leg dominance has increased to the point that the animal is an obligate biped, freeing up the forelimbs for uses such as manipulating food. These are not legs anymore, but arms. Next up, we have Coelophysis, a true dinosaur. The differences that make Coelophysis a dinosaur, but not Lagerpeton, are so minor that only a specialist could really reliably put one in the category dinosaur and the other outside it. This may well be where some of the first hints of feather development occur although this is still speculative. Let's fast forward in time from the late Triassic to the early Cretaceous to meet Cynosauropteryx. While feathers and Coelophysis are speculative, in Cynosauropteryx they are definitely known. So well known, in fact, that we even have information about what color they were. The feathers of Cynosauropteryx were simple, probably hollow filaments, more like hair in appearance than feathers of modern birds. These feathers were probably used to help insulate the creature and keep its body at a constant temperature, since by this point it is clear that such animals were warm-blooded active animals, not sluggish lizards. But how do we get from what is functionally fur to stiff feathers with a rachis or central shaft? What purpose could that serve if not flight? And it seems unlikely that these hair-like filaments would have been of much help in gliding. This is where we meet our next dinosaur, Oviraptor. Its name means egg snatcher. It got this name because its fossils were commonly associated with dinosaur nests, and it was assumed that it was trying to steal the eggs in order to eat them. But then, fantastic fossils such as this were found, and we discovered that far from stealing the eggs we found them with, they were actually brooding them. And not just brooding them, but doing so in the manner of birds, 
using their arms to cover many of the eggs to either side, but in a manner that only works with feathers that are stiff and stick out reliably beyond the arms. Oviraptor and its relatives certainly could not fly with such short arms and heavy body, and they were not even adapted for the high upstroke birds need to flap their wings for flight. But their method of brooding provides the tools that other dinosaurs would use to help them glide through the forests of the Mesozoic. Now let's take a look at the next step in half wings among dinosaurs. Here, it's time to meet Microraptor. Microraptor is also from the early Cretaceous, and superficially greatly resembles a bird, but it still could not fly. In fact, it was in the same family as such famous dinosaurs as Velociraptor and Deinonychus. And these were very much terrestrial animals that could not fly and likely couldn't even really glide to any appreciable extent. Like those other animals, the arms of Microraptor were still well adapted to clutch both tree trunks or branches and prey items. In this case, probably small vertebrates and insects. But as we can see in these beautifully preserved fossils, Microraptor had full-fledged aerodynamic wings, and not just two of them, but four. It is even possible that Microraptor could extend its glide by flapping its forelimbs. From here, it is only a matter of minor modifications to the shoulder and sternum, and we have full flying wings that are also fully functional grasping hands. As some dinosaurs became increasingly specialized for flight, their hands became less useful as grasping arms, and so the fingers were simplified to further optimize the hand for flying. At the same time, this freed up the legs to become more specialized for perching and takeoff, and so they lost their use as wings, with such functions now being superfluous. There is also one more example regarding dinosaurs that can tell us what good half a wing might be to an animal that can't quite fly yet. This example is not so much a particular organism, as it is a behavior common in many young birds whose wings are not well developed enough to let them fly, and in some ground birds who fly poorly. This behavior is called wing-assisted inclined running, or wear for short. The animal in question beats its forelimbs to provide thrust toward the ventral side of the body, and so increases its traction. This allows the animal to climb up very steep slopes, even nearly vertical ones. It is easy to see how this could help an animal survive. A small baby dinosaur that can use wear can scurry up a tree or rock face to escape from a larger predator. Alternatively, one could use this to recover one's previous perch after falling from a tree, a fall that would have been lessened in severity if the forelimbs can be used to help the animal glide. So this works together with the previous uses for half a wing to give ever more selection pressure for aerodynamic wings. Now that we have completed our trip through time and space, we see two things. The first is that half a wing is in fact quite useful, and that there are many animals both today and in the past with half wings. The other thing we see is that wings do not tend to arise from walking legs, but rather from grasping arms or in some cases forelimbs used primarily for climbing. Further, the path from leg to arm to wing may not be very direct. Who would have guessed that feathers could have been used for thermoregulation first, then this extended to brooding, and from here they were pre-adapted to form flight surfaces? It really is remarkable how unusual the path sometimes taken by evolution can be. Finally, just for good measure, here are a couple other half-winged animals. The first is the sugar glider a marsupial from Australia. Next is a flying squirrel, a very similar looking creature from North America. But the North American flying squirrel is a rodent, and as such it is a placental mammal. Essentially, no two mammals could be more distantly related, and yet these two look nearly identical in an outstanding example not just of the evolution of half a wing in each, but also an example of convergent evolution, as both animals evolved from different origins to fulfill a nearly identical ecological niche on opposite sides of the world. That's all for now. I hope you enjoyed our little trip through time and space. I have been Dino Attenborough on behalf of the Dinosaur Broadcasting Company. And on behalf of DBC America, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. If you've enjoyed this special presentation, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon so you're always alerted when new content is released.